Somebody say declare. The, I'm going to talk to you today about I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Say I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Say it again. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Number one, the power of the blood of Jesus is released when we give it voice. The power of the blood of Jesus is released when we give it voice. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11, the Bible says it this way. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to death. Can you read that with me? And say, they, come on, say it, all of us say, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the point of death. Now here we find that we overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb. Now, when we start talking about decree and declare, you know, obviously you and I have to understand that you and I will not receive from God until we agree with God. So the Bible says that God has said, so we can boldly say. So when God says something, God needs us to say what he said in order to have what he said. In, the, in Abraham's life, God, the Bible says that Abraham called those things that are not as though they already were. So when God called Abraham, Abraham, Abraham had to call himself Abraham in order to become what God said he would be, a father of many nations. So when God says something, you and I have to be that agreement, a voice with God. So God says it, you and I have to say it. If you, don't, you and I don't say it in faith, we don't receive it. How many know that's how you got saved? God said, I sent my son. I died for your sins. If you receive him in your heart, you'll be saved. You confess Jesus as Lord. Once you did that, then heaven backed up your confession and you got born again. How many know no devil in hell could stop the declaration of your faith? Somebody give God a praise like you believe that. I want to talk to you. Come on, that's right. Give God a praise like you believe that. I want to talk to you about declaring I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So if you're going to speak the blood of the Lamb, you have to understand the power of the blood of the Lamb. I'm going to focus mainly on the power of the blood to forgive us. But the blood does other things. The blood heals us. The blood cures us. The blood protects us. Remember in the book of Exodus where the people of God came out of Egyptian bondage. And the Bible says that Pharaoh, the great emperor Pharaoh, or the great, yeah, the emperor Pharaoh, he wouldn't let the people go, the Pharaoh. He wouldn't let them go. And because he wouldn't let them go, God sent nine plagues. Pharaoh still wouldn't let them go. God said, I'm going to send the, the last plague, the tenth plague. And the tenth plague is going to be the very, every firstborn child in Egypt is going to die. And God told him, I want you to put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and on the windows. So when the death angel comes and he sees the blood, he will not be able to go into your house. Because when he sees the blood, he'll pass over your house. The blood represents forgiveness. The blood represents God is with them now. How many thank God that the blood of Jesus is on your house? And when the devil, come on, when he comes to your house, he has to pass you by. Come on, somebody shout the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. When you speak the blood in the spiritual realm, you plead the blood. I plead the blood of Jesus or I apply the blood over my family, over my body, over my home, over my marriage. I apply the blood by faith. By faith, you can't see it, but the blood is being applied. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, all he sees is blood. He has to turn around and go the other way because he has no answer for the power and the application of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody shout, I am. Come on, I am. Come on, I am. Come on. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Come on, give God a praise like you believe that today. Now, the word redeemed uh, means, this is another definition. It means rescued from the hands that, the, that hold you captive. Rescued from the hands that have held you captive. So no matter what has held you captive, how many thank God that the blood can set you free? If it's a fear, the blood can set you free. If it's an addiction, the blood can set you free. If it's depression, the blood can set you free. No matter what it is, how many thank God that we are made free, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Come on, say amen. 
Ephesians 1, 7 says it this way. Let's read out loud. Say, in whom we have redemption or we are rescued from the hands that hold you captive. We, have, we are redeemed through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of of his grace how many thank God that when you got forgiven you got redeemed that means no matter what the enemy had you captive in you're free from that now can I be a Christian and still live in bondage yes you can but you don't have to stay in bondage you could come out of bondage no matter what it is anxiety fear oppression depression addiction poverty whatever it is you can come out of that in the name of Jesus by the power of the blood of Jesus I want you to declare with me I am come on I am come on I am redeemed by the no you're not saying it but it's okay we're gonna do it together say it I am redeemed by the blood of the lamb now if the blood of Jesus forgives me then you have to say what does it forgive me of then the Bible is very clear. The blood of Jesus forgives us of our sins, okay? So then if I'm going to value the blood and the blood has value, then I have to understand the power of what I'm being forgiven of, the sin. So I, I must understand the strength of the sin because if I don't understand the strength of the sin, I don't realize the value of the price that was paid to bring me out of that sin, to forgive me. The word forgive literally means to pay the debt of. So I had a debt of sin, and that sin was in my life, and the blood paid me out. The blood purchased me out. The blood redeemed me. The blood delivered me so of my sin. So, But what does the sin do? What's the power of the sin? Well, the power of sin is its ability to separate us from the presence of God. So when somebody is in sin and they live in a sinful lifestyle, they are living a lifestyle separated from the presence of God. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they were kicked out of the presence of God. That was the consequences of their sin. When Satan got kicked out of heaven because of sin, he was separated from the presence of God. And the devil has never changed. Misery loves company. And the enemy always wants to keep you and me and this world in sin separated from the presence of God. How many know we are not going to live a life separated from the presence of God, but we are going to live a life in fellowship with the presence of God. Come on, somebody clap like you were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So the power of sin is its ability to separate us from the presence of God. Now, I'm going to read you a story of a, uh, probably one of the best uh, Bible illustrations in the Old Testament uh, of a man who fell into sin and who cried out for mercy and God forgave him and he was restored. And the man's name is a famous man. His name was King David. Now, King David started out with nothing and God from nothing raised him up to be the greatest king Israel known. But just like many people that get raised to power, just like many people who start serving God, they start out on fire, they start, they start out hungry, they start out radical for God. But all the prosperity and the blessing kind of put him to sleep spiritually. And the next thing you know, David is in his palace and he's supposed to be going to war. He's supposed to be fighting, but he got comfortable. And after he got comfortable, the Bible says that he was on the rooftop of his house and he was looking over the rooftop. He looked down, and there down there was a young lady by the name of Bathsheba. And Bathsheba was taking a shower. So what David should have done, he should have looked and be like, whoa, turn the other way. But Billy Graham said, it's not the first look that gets you. It's the second look or the third look. Some of you are what I call rubberneckers. You got one big look. You're like, you look and you never stop looking. I remember when we, used to, we were, <laughs> you know what a rubberneck is, right? They're the pretty girl, and they go, Until your wife slaps you on the head. What's wrong with you? Oh, I was looking at the stars. Come on, somebody. Right? And so David starts staring. And then he, then after he, the Bible said, if you look, www.bathsheba.com, he started staring. After he was staring so long, the next thing you know, the Bible says that lust got in his heart. And then he called for her. He brought her up. He slept with her. He got her pregnant. He didn't know that. And then the next thing you know, uh, the message comes, David, I'm pregnant. It's not from my husband, Uriah, because he's been out battling. It's your child. David freaks out and says, I, I can't let this get out. So he tries to cover his sin, because that's what we always do when we sin. We try to cover our sin. He tries to cover his sin, and but the death is working. The presence of God is gone. 
So the death is working. When there's sin, the presence of God is gone. When the presence of God is gone, that's life. Death sets in. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Where there's sin, death will always follow. And so the death is on its way. It's going to come. Unless David gets the sin out, the death has to come. And, all, and so, so David's like, well, i got to cover this up. So he gets uh, news. He said, well, Uriah is in the battle. David says, well, put him on the front line of the battle. Because in the front line of the battle, he's guaranteed to die there. And if he dies, then I can take Bathsheba as my wife. We can have the child, and no one will know anything went wrong. Well, then David puts Uriah on the front line. Uriah dies, and then Bathsheba comes, and she says, uh, David, um, the baby, they're, they're having the baby, he marries her, and the baby dies because the sin is still working. The presence of God is gone. The baby dies. And then God let him eventually restore David when he got the sin out, and he gave him a son named Solomon. How many thank God that God is a merciful God, and he's a restoring God? Come on, somebody clap like that's powerful. Amen. And so this is the story, the, the back line of this story. And eventually David gets exposed by the prophet of God. He repents of his sin. And this is the testimony of a king who sinned, who got forgiveness, who got redemption through the blood of the lamb. Now, I want verse 1, he cries out for mercy. And he says, God, I'm sorry. But then look at the, the rest of verse 1. It says, blot out my transgressions, verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Somebody say iniquity. Now, David is recognizing this lust in my life is not just something that's been with me. If you study the scripture more carefully, David literally says that this particular area in my life, this sin tendency has been with me since the time I was in my mother's womb. So David basically says this is not just something that was my problem. This is something that's been in my family for a long, long time. Many people believe that David was actually birthed out of an adulterous affair that Jesse had with another woman. And that's why when the prophet of God showed up to anoint the next king, the, 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 the father, Jesse, didn't even want to bring out David because David was an in, he was, he was a son that was born out of adultery. Come on, talk to me somebody. So David here is saying, this is a generational curse in my life and this thing finally caught up to me. A lot of you, listen to me, a lot of us, we deal with generational curses, familiar spirits, things that have been in our family, anger, rage, early death, sickness, disease. There's maybe in some of your family there's been perversion, molestation, divorce, uh, maybe everyone in your family get, but, but they lose their virginity when they're young, uh, like uh, before they're married. Those are all curses. Deuteronomy 28. And those things are curses that have come upon our lives because somebody in our past didn't honor God, but they deserved their flesh and their own desires. But you and I, because of the blood of Jesus, have been redeemed from those curses, and you have to stand your ground so your children don't have to deal with your daddy's devil. Come on, somebody clap like this is powerful today. I need, three, I need more than three claps and an amen. This is a powerful word today. So we have to break these curses. So I'm dealing with the curses that my dad should have dealt with. It wasn't even in my grandpa. It was probably in my great grandpa. I don't know that far back. But I've dealt with them so my son doesn't have to deal with them. Because a bloodline has been started by the blood of the lamb. And the Lozano family is no longer under a generational curse. The Lozano family is under a generational blessing. Because we have a new bloodline. And it's the blood of the son of the living God. I am redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Come on, somebody clap like you believe that today. Can I keep going? So then he says, cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin. Listen to this. My sin is always before me. That's that guilty conscience. And there's nothing like a guilty conscience. It's the worst feeling in the world to have a guilty conscience. There's nothing like it. You can't take a shower to get rid of it. There's nothing that gets rid of it. Only God's blood can get rid of a guilty conscience. And maybe today you have a guilty conscience. I want you to know that the blood of Jesus, see, you felt that? You felt that? Exactly. But the blood of Jesus can wash you from that guilty conscience today. Come on, somebody say amen to that. Powerful. Powerful. Look at verse 4. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Verse 7. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Listen to me. Listen to me. I don't care. There's nothing more valuable in this world than to be clean on the inside. There's no, listen to me, there's nothing more valuable on this planet 
than to be clean on the inside. I remember when I first experienced this in my life. And this is something you experience, but you have to fight to keep clean on the inside. Later, David said, you didn't desire on the outside. You desired, watch me, truth in my inward parts. That means on the inside of us, there has to be truth in our hearts, in our motive, in our intentions, in our spirit, in our soul, in our mind, in our will, in our emotion. There has to be a cleanliness in there. And there's nothing like it. When there's cleanness in there, there's power. When there's cleanness in there, there's presence of God. When there's dirty and filthiness in there, we got to get it out. Because that's the enemy working in your heart, setting you up for failure, setting you up for the fall, setting you up to make another mistake and be more depressed and more oppressed and more guilty in your conscience. Yes, you're a Christian, but it doesn't exempt you from that. You have to go before God and let God clean you on the inside and you could stay clean. Come on, somebody give God a praise like you're going to be cleansed today. What do you, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Today... Our friends and our families and our loved ones, they're going to get baptized. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to have that clean feeling. That's, what they're gonna, that's what's going to happen today. But the question is, are they going to keep that clean feeling? And that's why we have lifestyle of freedom. Why do we do lifestyle of freedom? To teach people how to get clean and to stay clean. How to get free and to stay free. Come on, somebody give God a praise. Like this is power. Somebody shout, I am. Come on, declare, I am. Come on, declare, I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Then he, David, this is heavy, huh? Feel the presence of God? Let's just keep going. Verse 8. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. And again, how many of you have ever had a broken bone? I've had a broken bone. I've had a lot of broken bones. I used to be a skater. I've broken every bone. I, I put football, broke bones. I, just, I was like a bone breaker. Come on, somebody. I, I live with broken ankles forever. And, and even when I play basketball, I still break people's ankles. No, I'm just kidding. But the truth be told... When you, if you ever really broken a bone, I mean, you could hear that thing break on the inside of you. You feel like everyone else heard it, like pop. You're like, what was that? Because something broke inside your body. But the truth is, it's so miserable. It's so painful. But that's what sin is like. That's what bitterness is like. That's what unforgiveness is like. It's like bitterness. It's like brokenness. It's like, oh, and you just live with that thing. And what, that's why people drink. They try to drink it out. They try to get, get busy. They social media it out, uh, media it out, television it out, get busy, work, work, work it out. Uh, they try to maybe sleep around and promiscuous. They're just trying to drown that voice out. But you can't run from you. You cannot run from you. It's in you. we got to get it out of you so you can have joy, so you can have peace so you could be clean. Come on, somebody give God a praise. This is good stuff today. Come on, you could do better than that. Give God one more praise today. Verse 9, then, then he says, hide your, he said, hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquity. Like, I'm never going to remember them. You're not going to remember them. Let me say this. When God forgives you of iniquity, listen to what I'm going to tell you. When he forgives you, this is the part where, listen, the blood of Jesus speaks, okay? It speaks. The blood of innocent people speak when they die. Like, remember Cain killed Abel, and the blood of Abel spoke from the ground. Abel, um, Abel was dead, but his blood spoke. And all these babies that were aborted in America, their blood speaks for judgment. It's true. And when innocent blood is, is shed, it speaks. Well, the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ speaks from the grave. And it speaks of mercy. It speaks of grace. It speaks of forgiveness. And it speaks of judgment. Listen to me. It speaks of judgment. Because on the cross, Jesus was judged for you and for me. He was judged for your sin. That's why he died and he went straight to hell. And he left your sin there. So you'd never have to go there. How many thank God that the blood of Jesus speaks from the throne of God. It speaks from the mercy seat of God and it says they've already been judged they've already been condemned and have already forgiven them come on how many we got to give voice to the blood and when God says I've blotted out your transgressions we got to say God if you've forgiven me I'm never going to bring it up in my thought life again I don't care what the devil said I don't care what others say if I'm forgiven my sin has been blotted out and I am now my name is written in the Lamb's book of life come on somebody give God a praise like your iniquities have been blotted out. Verse 10, he keeps going. He goes, create in me now. Again, a clean heart. So he wants that clean heart, those clean pipes on the inside. Nothing like it. Now you got to listen. Listen to David. 
and renew a steadfast spirit within me. But he look at, he's saying, creating me a clean heart. Listen to that. This is a man who has all the money a man could ever want. This is a man who has every relationship he could want. This is a man that has all the power, authority. This is for people who say, if I make more money, if I have better relationships, if I have this and if I have this and that, then I'm going to be happy. But no, David has everything a man could ever want. And he's saying, I'm not happy as long as the presence of God is not in my life. So that lets you know, if you're going to be satisfied, it doesn't come from marriage. It doesn't come from children. It doesn't come from wealth. It doesn't come from education. Satisfaction comes from the presence of the Lord. Somebody shout amen. My God. Then out of that place, Marriage is awesome. Parenting is awesome. Business is awesome. Leadership is awesome. But the presence of God is the preeminent thing in our lives. And sin separates us from the presence of God. But as sin separates me from the presence of God, the blood of the Lamb forgives me and pushes me in to the presence of God. That I can come boldly to the throne of grace every single day day whenever I need it and let God's presence fill my life. How many thank God for the presence of the Lord on and in and through your life? Then he, then he turns around and he says, renew a steadfast spirit within me. So we, we, we see a, a godly reverence and a godly fear. He says, I don't want to just be clean. I don't want to just be forgiven. I don't want to just have a, a, a fresh start. No, I want a steadfast spirit. That word steadfast means loyal hearted, commitment. He said, I want to be loyal to you, God. I don't want to keep sinning with Bathsheba's. I don't want to keep ble ble looking over balconies. I don't want to keep failing you. Give me a steadfast spirit. So I don't, I don't have to stumble in the same area every other month or every other year. I want, to, I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I don't want to go back to my old life. Give me, oh God, a steadfast spirit. How many know God has the power to set you free? And the power to keep you free. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Give God a shout of praise like you believe God has the power to set you free and to keep you free. John said it this way, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Do me a favor, turn around to somebody, high five somebody next to you and say God has the power to keep you free. Thank God three people did it. Amen. Verse 11. Can I keep on going? I'm going to do it anyway. He said, do not cast me away. Look at this. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. He said, I'm tired of living in debt. I'm tired of all this bad stuff happening because of my sin. Get this thing out of my life. Keep it out of my life. This is a man who at one time had nothing. He was on the run for his life. Saul was trying to kill him. He was in the backside of the de desert. He was a nothing. He was a nobody. But in those times, he was a happy man. He said, he said, in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. Now he's got everything, but he's got depression. He's got everything, but he's got failure. He's got everything, but he's got brokenness. Why? Because of sin. He said, get the sin out and keep the sin out because I want the joy of the Lord back in my life. My friend, maybe you're a backslider today and you walk with God, but you went the other way. You know you're not happy. You're the most miserable person in this place right now. Maybe you're listening to me on television. You're listening to me around the world, internet. I don't know. And you say, you're a backslider and you've made a, you could, you could fake everyone out. I'm happy. I'm having a good time. But when you get home at night, you're all alone. You're trying to quiet all the voices out with all the parting and the noise. And, but the reality is you're empty. you got sin in your life. The presence of God is gone. But today God said, I'm going to forgive you by my blood. I'm going to give you a fresh start. And I'm going to put a steadfast spirit in you. And you're going to stop your backsliding. I'm going to heal you of your backsliding. I'm going to know God didn't call you to live miserable. He didn't call you to live frustrated. He didn't call you to live angry and bitter. He called you to live holy. He called you to live clean. He called you to have joy unspeakable and full of the glory of the Lord. Come on, somebody give God a praise. Stand on your feet all in this room now. Acts 3.19 says it this way. Repent and be converted that your sins may be forgiven so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Today, we're going to have times of refreshing. 
that are going to come from the presence of the Lord. Hi, how you doing? I want to take a minute and I want to talk to you about the power of partnership. In the book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 19, Paul the Apostle said something very, very powerful that has changed my life and I believe it can change your life. He said that my God would supply all your need. Paul did not say that their God would supply, but he said that his God would supply. Because the Philippian church partnered with Paul, Paul realized something very, very powerful, that the same blessing that was on his life was now available to the Philippian church. And that is a very powerful spiritual principle. And I want you to pray about this principle, about partnership. If you feel in your heart as you pray to partner with this ministry, I believe that this anointing that's on this ministry, which is the anointing to bring freedom and to restore lives, will come into your life. It will come into your family. And I believe the next thing you know, you're going to experience the same freedom that thousands experience every week. As you partner with us, I believe the same anointing that's on this house is going to come on your house. The way you can partner is, number one, pray. And number two, give. You can give online. You can give through mail. Wherever you feel led to do that. But I do believe the same blessing that's on this house will be on your house. And if you commit to pray for us, we commit to pray for you. And I believe the same freedom that's in this house is going to come to your house. We love you. God bless you. And we'll hopefully hear from you soon. Bye-bye.